Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always is a man that all he wants for Christmas is a date with Rachel McAdams. He is the captain. Hey, girl, if you're a bird, then I'm a bird, too. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are drinking Great Lakes Brewing Company's Christmas Ale, garage grade four out of five bottle caps. Get your hands on some Christmas Ale. It will certainly lift your spirits, and this round of holiday cheer was brought to us by these good friends right here. First up, we have Cody and Gabby in El Dorado, California. And a big happy holidays to Katie in Grand Junction, Colorado. And next, a big shout out to Ariel in Kansas City and her sister Jennifer in South Ridding. And then one of my favorite places, Memphis, Tennessee. Big shout out to Alexandria and Matt. And next we have Lorraine from Las Cruces, New Mexico. And last but not least, we have husband and wife Paul and Jacqueline Bean. So thanks to everybody for filling up the fridge for this week's show. And happy holidays to every one of you out there. If you want to buy us around for the new year, go to TrueCrimeGarage.com and click on the donate button. A little quick announcement from Parts Unknown. If you've seen Santa Claus kissing any mommies, Knock that mother sucker out. All right. And for everything social media, we are at True Crime Garage. Captain, that is enough of the business. Everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab some eggnog. Let's talk some true crime. I want to start off by going through some things that took place in the Eliza Sherman case this year in 2017. So when this year rolled in, just under four years after the murder of 53-year-old Eliza Sherman, Mm -hmm. the case remained unsolved despite investigators' best efforts and billboards seeking justice for Eliza and a circle of family and friends who kept her memory alive and the case alive. Eliza Sherman's daughter, Jennifer, she has led marches, vigils, and benefits in her mother's name and worked to become an advocate for women who face domestic abuse and filed a civil suit against her father. Yeah, nothing causes more attention than family suing family. And when we left off with episode three, we were talking about Gregory Moore. Gregory Moore was Elisa's attorney who had been charged with inducing panic as far as calling in three different bomb threats. Right. And as well as he has been indicted on charges that may pertain to Elisa's cases. Remember, the investigator stated that This guy, he's got some questions to answer, and hopefully that stuff will come out in court. The investigators are wondering why Gregory Moore would not talk with them. If he didn't have anything to hide, why would he not speak with them? Right, but they also caught him in a couple lies. Yes. So Gregory Moore, he originally faced up to three years in prison for all of these charges, but after what I'm sure was some kind of deal that was struck, because... Mm -hmm. He originally faced a lot more charges than this. Moore ended up pleading guilty to felony inducing panic and misdemeanor falsification charges for the phony statements given to the police. A Cuyahoga County judge imposed the sentence. This was of 180 days, and the sentence also included three years of probation and 350 hours of community service once Moore was released from the Cuyahoga County Jail. So Gregory Moore was to report to jail on June 1st of this year and serve 90 days of his 180 days in prison. So they're going to split it in half, let him serve the first part and then the second part. Well, after that, the judge ordered him to spend one full week in jail in each of the following 12 months. Okay. And while he would be out, he would be monitored by GPS uh, when he's not in jail. Why does he get his back? Why they give him special privileges? Just serve your 180 days and be done with it. The judge told Moore during the court proceedings, you've taken everything an attorney stands for and turned it upside down. I agree 100% with that. I don't fully agree with the, with the sentence here. The sentence okay. almost to me makes as little sense as the bomb threats that he called in. Right. Okay, so it sounds to me with that statement that the judge would like to hold more to some kind of. But, I mean, how do you well, how do you make that statement and not hold him to a higher standard? Because he's basically right. a clerk of the court almost. I mean, he's an attorney. He's taken an oath with the state of Ohio, mm-hmm. 
and the some of the charges are actually all of the charges that he's involved in are some form of obstruction of justice right calling in the bomb threats to delay court proceedings lying to your client lying to the police well not to mention the wasted taxpayer money for you know having to move the court dates to close down those courts yeah and i think the thing here is i think this more guy got off easy I mean, he really, he kind of begged and pleaded with the court saying, you know, I'm a family man now. I'm married. I have a one-year-old. I don't know if he has a son or daughter, but he has a one-year-old child. And to me, I don't understand this. I think you either throw the book at him or it, it just makes no sense to me. And the thing is, why not just like you said, either serve, just make him serve the sentence and be done with it. Right. Right. Instead of this, hey, you can come back one week out of every month of the following year and serve serve one week, and then we're going to let you out, and then you come back for another week. Weird. Right. But Weird we, stuff. Right. But we have a lawyer that uh, works for you know a pretty successful uh, law firm. They do big, you know, probably multi, multi-million dollar divorces, and he's white. So that's why they gave him a break. Hey, you serve 90 days and then we'll break it up a week each month. Well, I don't know that I want to get into the head of the judge and say that's why he was leaning on him. I mean, the guy lost his license to practice law in the state of Ohio. Well, he should have. Right. Well, exactly. Well, so therefore he's upon the sentencing. He's no longer an attorney mm -hmm. with anyone. Now, Gregory Moore ignored questions from reporters as he entered and exited the courtroom during those proceedings. He apologized to his family and said he regrets daily his actions that have affected people that are here with us today and people that are not. Mm -hmm. Gregory Moore never mentioned Aliza Sherman by name or he never apologized to her family either. Right. Because the guy's a piece of shit. So, I mean, he's a liar and he's not going to take responsibility for any involvement he had in her death. Now, regarding the, uh, and I don't know that this is what it was in fact called because I think her name has a hyphen in it now, but regarding the Sherman versus Sherman lawsuit where Mm -hmm. Jennifer argued funds belonged to Aliza's estate since she was the sole proprietor of the account and had this issue been resolved in court, it may have belonged to Eliza upon the divorce. Right. Sanford contended that the funds were considered marital assets used for supporting the family and therefore never belonged solely to Eliza. Four months after Jennifer filed the suit against Sanford, her older brother, Josh filed a motion to remove her as co-executor of Eliza's estate mm. in the motion. He alleged his sister had a separate agenda she viewed Samford as a person of interest in the death of their mother and therefore could not act on behalf of Elisa's estate without bias. Right. Which makes some sense. But you got a family that's already gone through a bunch, you know, before the murder took place. And now you have this murder and now you have a, a house even more divided because it seems to me that she believes that her father was responsible in some way. And it seems like her brothers do not uh, share that same feeling. Well, Josh eventually dropped his claim in. Um, he eventually dropped this claim after the lawsuit was filed. Okay. Then in December of 2017. So just this month, all sides agreed to settle the civil suit. So Sanford Sherman agreed to pay 110 thousand dollars to Aliza's estate with the stipulation that Jennifer would forever release and discharge him from any claims they might make in the future. Jennifer agreed to Sanford's stipulation with one addendum. If in the future he is convicted of any criminal offense related to her mother's death, she reserves the right to renew her fight and make further claims against him. Okay, this is it. Pretty interesting. A little bit to unpack, though. I mean, so he's given her a very, very small percent of what really she's fighting for. But he is saying, hey, um, and this agreement works, 
And she's saying, well, the only way it doesn't work is if we can convict you of this crime. Right, right. If he's ever facing any type of criminal charges regarding her case. You know, he doesn't necessarily have to be convicted of murder or anything like that. We're talking about Gregory Moore just lying to Eliza and lying to police is convicted of a criminal charge uh, regarding Eliza's case. So, right. So if he, you know, if her father lied to law enforcement, then that's enough for her to reopen up her case. Yeah. Or lied in any of the depositions that he gave in the lawsuit case in regards to discussing information between him and his wife and dealings between him and his uh, now deceased wife. Yeah, this just seems like a case that has so many twists and turns that you can't even make up. I mean, you can't write this. Well, I don't know that... I agree with the twists and turns, and the reason why there's twists and turns is because the way that they come out and the way that they're eventually presented to the public. When you really nail this story down, there were not a lot of twists and turns along the way. And what I mean by that are there are two things. One, a lot of the things that were going on between Eliza and her husband came out during the lawsuit that came out well after she was killed. Okay, these were all things that both of them knew that they were dealing with. Both of them knew that they were going on and happenings that were taking place for the most part that Eliza knew about and for the most part that, that Sanford knew about. Right. This just didn't come out to the public until after she was murdered. These are things that would have very likely have come out during the divorce proceedings. The other thing is these bomb threats. Technically, he made all three of those bomb threats during the course of working her case well before it ever went to trial in 2013. He, he did that last bomb that threat Gregory Moore did in July of 2012. This thing was not going to go to trial until March of 2013, March 25th or 26th. Right. So that was old news. Now, the, the thing that is the twist and turn that comes out in this is that the attorney is not where he said he would be on that day. That's the twist and that's the turn for me. That's the big one. Mm -hmm. It seems like Sanford was um, cooperating with police in the beginning. It seems like Gregory Moore was cooperating with police in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the reasoning why... Sanford probably stopped cooperating with police was at some point he was facing a lawsuit. He has a whole other case to deal with. Yeah. And probably, you know, his attorneys probably advised him to. I mean, right. Well, yeah. Yeah. They would advise him to say, let's focus on this lawsuit. We can deal with the police once this stuff is over with. And furthermore, as far as Gregory Moore goes, that that's that's the twist and turn. He agreed with the he he agreed to cooperate with police in the beginning. Why? That was just to make him look like he was doing what he said he was doing. It wasn't until he was presented with evidence that he was not in fact doing what he was saying he was doing that that he decided, hey, he clammed up and said, Nope, not talking anymore. Well, he seems like such a chronic liar and you know, I'm gonna lie about these bomb you know, calling these bomb threats to get out of my job get out of my responsibilities. Oh, I'll talk to the police. I'm not going to give them correct information. I can lie my way out of this, but they caught him in the lie. Where this leaves us is this. Gregory Moore denies having anything to do with Elisa's murder, and he is technically not considered a suspect. Sanford Sherman denies having anything to do with Elisa's murder as well, and again, not technically considered a suspect. Police won't say. They will not say whether the divorce attorney and Aliza's husband have any ties together. So who is the person in the hooded jacket caught on surveillance video? Cops could never <sighs> identify who that was. My thoughts, Sanford's friend describes the murder to a T with that perfect murder plot described to him from his friend. Sanford was at home, and I put a question mark by that. Mm -hmm. Jennifer and Jeremy's statements state that Sanford was at home at 7.45 p.m. The body type is not the same as the person seen in the video. So Sanford... His, his body type, yeah. Correct. Could Sanford have hired someone to kill his wife and potentially save him $2 million or who knows how much more money? Yes, it's very possible. Mm -hmm. But when I sit here, when I try to look at these two suspects and wonder who was involved in this case and who was not... 
I often wonder, would Sanford have even known where Eliza would have been when she was killed? Three people lived in the Sanford house that day, and mm-hmm. Jeremy did not know where Eliza was going that day. And how about this perfect murder situation? Okay, so the perfect murder is not just getting away with murder. Not just setting things up and putting them into place so that you can kill someone and the police never be able to tie it to you or have enough evidence to put you away. No, in my opinion, the perfect murder is killing someone, getting away with it, and then getting someone else to take the fall. That way you don't have this shadow on you for the rest of your days. Mm -hmm. I think it's possible that maybe what Gregory Moore went for or may have gotten away with, of course, no one took the fall, but maybe he thought there was enough of a history with Eliza and her husband that the police and the general public would never look beyond that. Right. Because like always the number one suspect is the, you know, normally the husband. And like we said earlier, Moore was originally scheduled to meet with Eliza on Saturday, the day before she was killed. I stated that I'm uncertain if that meeting actually occurred, but one thing we do know is he Gregory Moore was the one that scheduled the meeting for Sunday, the day she was killed. Now, he was pushing the meeting back that day, according to these text messages. It's possible they met on Saturday, and then he asked for additional time with her on Sunday, or pushed Saturday's meeting to Sunday. Right, right. And either way, I mean, I don't think that really matters. I mean, because if he, I don't think you're saying that he would actually do the crime himself. Is that what you're saying about Gregory? Well, I'll take you through this. Because what I want to point out here is regardless, he scheduled the meeting. He pushed the time back on Sunday. He told Eliza he was in his office when he clearly was not. He told the police the same. The police have some evidence pointing them to the fact that Moore was in his office until an hour before and then back in his office an hour after the murder. So for roughly a 60-minute window, he is gone from his office during the time that he told Eliza and the police that he was in his office, and then she is killed out front during that same time frame. And while I think Sanford would be someone that you should possibly look at as someone that would hire a hit on his wife, mm-hmm. the Gregory Moore guy strikes me as more of a dm wire, a do-murder-yourself kind of guy. He called in those bomb threats himself, dumb enough to use his own cell phone. Then he uses his cell to communicate with Eliza minutes before her death, lying about where he was. And here's the thing. If he were the hitman hiring type, well, then why not just be in your office? That's a great alibi. I was in my office for a, for our scheduled meeting. Right. I, I went downstairs to unlock the door to let her in, and then I heard her screams. I rushed outside. I found her bleeding badly on the sidewalk. I comforted her, and I called 911. The perfect alibi if he were to hire someone. Moore is not that smart. Then we have the scenario, and I know a lot of people are thinking this because they just can't let go of the husband did it theory. The thought is, well, maybe the husband hired the, the attorney to kill Aliza or hired the attorney to find someone to kill Aliza. The problem I have with that, Sanford is not that dumb. That, my friends, is the plan of a moron, right? I'll call or talk to my wife's divor- divorce attorney and ask him to assist me in her murder. Okay, here's your case on a silver platter. And oh, and not only will you have a successful case for the divorce where my wife gets all of the money and everything we own, I'll have to go to prison as well. Sanford is a retired, very successful doctor. That's not him. That's not the plan that this guy makes. Then the question for more becomes being a prime suspect is motive. What could be his motive? His motive may have just be as dumb as this, that he was unprepared for court and he killed her. Right. Well, that's a stretch. A lot of people would say, I don't think so. He called in three bomb threats on three separate occasions to government buildings. Let me throw this scenario at you. That's a felony, my friends. And (laughs) And had someone 
Picture this. He calls uh, in this I'm bomb threat. It right now. That's a felony. Had someone, an elderly man or woman, had a heart attack when they started evacuating the building that day? Uh-huh. Well, Mr. Lawyer Boy would have been charged with the death of that individual during, during the course of committing a felony. The other thing here with Gregory Moore, and this is not very scientific, but there is something severely off about this guy. I've stared at his picture and I've looked at a lot of bad people's photos and he gives me that same very bad feeling that I cannot put my finger on it. Bad feeling that I get when I see a bad person. I just feel that he is the evil coward that they are looking for. I think Jennifer and the Sherman family should file some type of wrongful death suit against him. Heck, you were awarded some of that money from the lawsuit. That would be a really good use for it. And I think there are things in, investigatively that will be, that could be done, that you may not be able to do in criminal proceedings through the local law enforcement that may bring something to light where you can see charges brought against this weasel, Gregory Moore. All right, cheers, mates. Happy cheers, holidays. Cheers, cheers, cheers. Happy holidays. So I guess uh, my question for you is looking at this footage, and it's roughly about a minute-long footage that they have of the surveillance tape. And if you want to go check that out, it's right on the homepage of truecrimegarage.com. Uh, also, there's clips of that on our Instagram, at truecrimegarage. Now, looking at this, we can pull up and watch the videotape, but we do have at least images of Gregory Moore. And we do have images of the husband, right. Sanford Sherman. So my question to you and, and listeners as well, do, does any of these, do either of these two individuals fit what we're seeing on the surveillance camera? I, I definitely Sanford does not fit what I see on the surveillance camera. I cannot rule out, Gregory Moore. I don't think that uh, the surveillance camera provides enough detail as far as height and weight mm -hmm. for me to rule him out. His body type is not um, totally off, in my opinion. He seems a little thicker than the individual in the footage to me. Possibly, if but, but uh, the thing that I try to remind myself is when we look at this, what assumptions are we making about the coat or the jacket or the hoodie that's being worn in the surveillance? Are we, are we looking at this thing and going, well, this is adding padding and it's adding weight and it's adding size to this person. There's a chance it's not adding much to this person at all. I, I just, I here, Okay. Here, and here's another problem that I go back to regarding this surveillance footage. And I, and mm -hmm. I kind of forgot to bring this up the other day when we were discussing it. Where does this person come from? Yeah. We don't have any cameras. That, that freaking bothers me to, like you wouldn't believe. And I'll tell you what. There, I've, there has to be footage, uh, more footage than this. Well, I guarantee you that rumor that was going around that there's actual camera footage of the murder. I believe that that's the case. And of course, they're not going to release that. It doesn't help anybody in the public to see that. No, but they can do certain things to figure out what the size of the individual is. Not only height, but width. Right. And I think that would be a big help, right? Right. But the other thing, again, I'm going back to where did this person come from? And I think that could help the investigation in some form because, look, we're we're shown footage of this person obviously fleeing the scene. They're going they, – this person is either running to a building, going to run to hiding somewhere, or run to a vehicle. Right. Where did this person come from? This person – I'm guessing this person did not come from this same, same direction. There are cameras all over this section of downtown Cleveland. Mm -hmm. There is very likely footage of this individual arriving to the crime scene and then attacking her and then fleeing. I just, I can't figure out where this person came from. And that's the other, that's the problem I have with the attorney. I look, he put her there at that exact time. He delayed her leaving there at that exact time. He left his office roughly 
an hour before and, and an hour afterwards. I think I said a 60 minute window. That's incorrect. That would be about an hour and 20 minute window. I'm sorry. I'm, kidding. I'm still screwing that up. That's a two hour window. Let's say, let's say it's roughly a two hour window, maybe two and a half hours at that. Mm. Well, it's, you know, this is that's, good holiday beer. You know? That's the perfect amount of time to, to pretend to be in your office, to get her to go there, leave, change into this disguise, uh-huh. run, come running from God knows where, attack her, flee the scene, returning to, I'm guessing, a vehicle or another building or something like that, and changing out of those clothes and returning to your office. It's the perfect amount of time. And here's the other problem. Whether you think it's the perfect amount of time or not, I don't need you to agree with me. The problem is this. Where the hell were you? If you're innocent of this attack, you would think you would be screaming it from the mountaintops going, all right, I lied to her. Uh I went to IHOP and I had a, I had a stack of pancakes. Like you wouldn't believe I was just being ignorant. I didn't have anything to discuss with her. I was avoiding, I was avoiding the meeting or not only here's the receipt, just say you were someplace else. Just give us some damn place that you were. I was in a park bench. Nobody saw me. Nobody saw me leave. (laughs) Nobody saw me arrive. No, nobody saw me. I was in a place where nobody could see me. I was in the middle of a field out in the middle of nowhere. Give us some explanation other than going, I was in my office. Well, sir, we can prove you were not at that time. Right, okay. Right. Well, I'm not talking to you anymore. <laughs> All right. But law enforcement has to do, uh, you know, I don't want to say a better job because I don't think that's fair, but that, you know, now that he's not talking to you, that's the cat and mouse game, right? Here's, here's something interesting that I want to bring up on this footage. Now, this is the, of the video I posted. Again, it's at truecrimegarage.com. 55 seconds. We're pretty clear that this is some kind of vehicle. Um, so 55. Yeah, it looks like a four-door sedan, let's say, to give you a, a size idea of yeah. what we're looking at. He, this individual is clearly taller than this car. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and, and like I said before, I was thinking maybe that this uh, suspect is five four five five which would rule out a lot of women but here i think this clearly states that my initial thoughts are wrong the size of those shoulders in comparison to the height of the rooftop of that vehicle makes me believe this would be a a person a man a male of somewhat average size right and so again you know like i said i think this individual runs like a girl but so does steven seagal right so, and, and here's another thing too, is if you notice all the pictures of uh, Moore, right? He kind of has this uh, rounded back. Everything's rounded back. Mm-hmm. Uh, not so much there. <laughs> I pull up a picture that, but he kind of has this rounded back and you can clearly see when the, when the individual is running away, when you see the Kia sign and you see the Valvoline sign. When you see it running away, you can clearly see more of a rounded back. Yeah, I'm convinced it's him. I mean, I'll go on the record saying that. I think it was him. I think he did it himself. And I think that for reasons we may never understand, I don't think he was hired by by uh, Elisa's husband at all to do this. I, I really just... <laughs> I mean, there's there's nothing that doesn't point to him for me. Now that would be a twist and turn. Is the it? distraction? I think I think the things that people think point away from him, they're just distractions. They're not technically things that point away from him. They're just like, like weird suspicions that you have about the husband. All oh, things that okay, we pointed so, out through along this. I think people right. get clouded with everything going on with the husband. I think that right. the divorce really clouds things right there. You're really talking about when you boil it down regarding Sanford. The only motive he has is money. You know, some people go, well, yeah, but, he, but that's two million reasons. No, no, no. I get that. I get that. Right. But we've also learned that that he occurred over eight hundred thousand dollars in transfer fees and penalties when he moved that money around. So now we're talking about one point two million. Right. Right. And I get I get it. People have killed people for less money. Right. I totally get it. But the thing what I'm getting at is when people go, well, he was a bad husband. He was abusive. He He had relationships outside the marriage and he wanted the money. The problem I have with that is when you boil it down to it, the only motive he has is money. Get rid of all those other problems that took place during the marriage because guess what? In two days, his marriage was over. In two days, his marriage was over. Running around behind his wife's back, not a motive. 
he was going to be free to date whoever he wanted in a couple of days. Uh huh. You know, being a jerk and being abusive and being probably unhappy himself in his home life. That's over in two days for him. The only motive he has at this point is money. All right. So with the, with the husband, right? Yeah. The big motive is money. Then the other thing too, is this conversation of the perfect murder. Uh, The problem I have with this whole idea is he's not the one that came up with the idea of what the perfect murder is. You know, it's, it's some conversation that he's having with a friend and also it's a friend of a law enforcement. It's just not, it's not like he went, you know, he hung out with his buddy. That's a dry cleaner. And he's like, Hey man, how do you think you could get away with the perfect murder? (laughs) There are some people and you know, this is like our whole lives has become true crime. I'm drinking beer at a local pub, you know, and, and somebody goes, what do you do for a living? Well, you know, I got this show about true crime and they go, Oh, the, what do you think about John Benet Ramsey? You know, it's like normally when people are trying to start conversation, they, they go towards your area of expertise, right? So he didn't come up with this idea and he also didn't even admit to having this conversation. So I don't know about that. Well, in, in fairness, he wasn't even asked if he had directly, if he in fact had this conversation. Okay. And the thing here is, and you you hit something on something very important and very key here. We were not present for the entirety of that conversation where the quote unquote perfect murder scenario is discussed. There were several different reports giving this discussion. One of them says, a couple of them say that this conversation happened on more than one occasion. Right. There are others that state that it was only a one-time conversation. So we don't know which is correct, but let's say this, and I think you hit on something very important here. I'm guessing that because he's a doctor, he's quite a bit smarter than the old Nick sitting here in the garage that couldn't even figure out that mm. an hour before and an hour after Isn't a murder it? is two hours, not one hour. Hey, to be fair, you have drank Way more than your share of beer. So the thing I'm getting at is he's probably, he could be an intellectual and he may have just been having what he considered to be an intellectual conversation with somebody that works in the law enforcement field. What if at the beginning of that conversation, his friend in law enforcement says, you know, we were investigating that we investigated that thing years ago and it, it was almost like the perfect murder. And he goes, well, how would one commit the perfect murder? Right. Or why is that a perfect murder? You know, it, it could have been talking about something outside of that. Yeah, and I th- and then the other point that I think the public really gets cloudy as far as the husband goes is that you have one of his one of his children is not really on his side. Is not team dad. Where the other children are coming r- right out during the memorial and saying, "Hey, look, my father had nothing to do with this," and you want to protect your father. I mean. But you know that your father is going to get questioned by the police. He obviously was cooperating with the police. We both agree. He lawyered lawyered up. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But the fact that the daughter is, you know, still against him. But in all fairness, she was against him probably three, four years before this. Yeah, it seems like they had had a falling out. Like you said, three or four years at some point, I believe it's she points to 2010 or 2011 when she had totally disowned her father. And I'm with you. I think then the other question is, how would he know where she's going to be? There's a chance he didn't even know that. Okay, All right. This is this is one thing that I can't I have a problem getting over. Remember, we talked about the scenario where he claims where Sanford claims to and he did tell friends that he believed that she had purchased some kind of recording device and was recording their conversations, trying to get him to do something, fly off the handle, and then use it against him later. Right. From my understanding in these depositions, Sanford did end up, he ended up purchasing his own recording device. Mm -hmm. Now, Elisa made a statement to either one of her friends or a relative that she believed she was being recorded when she was at home without Sanford having been there because she thought from time to time he was quoting things that she said while on the phone with friends or relatives when he was not in the room or right, not at right, home. Right. So, so that's how he could know if she in fact had a phone call with 
her her lawyer. Right. Then possibly he could have overheard that. And then the other situation is we know that she had a phone call with her friend a couple days in advance because the friend offered to go to the meeting with her where Elisa said, no, I don't need to go t- with you. Right, right. The problem with that though, is if you hire somebody to kill her for that meeting that you overheard when you're recording with some pen device or whatever you purchased and you leave it in the kitchen or in her office or whatever, this meeting kept, it keeps getting moved. Right, right, right. It keeps getting moved. When you don't know if somebody's going to go with it or not. It's almost being moved up to the point of just within hours of the crime going down. So, so what is he on a, on the phone constantly with the guy he hired going, wait, wait, wait hold, hold on. on. Hold I on. think the meeting just got moved. And then think about the chances of how many times she would, he would have missed those additional conversations moving that meeting. And a lot of this communication, from my understanding, some of it took place via text message. He would have heard nothing. Right. He would yes. have no way of tracing that the meeting got moved to that time period. Yeah. So then we go I, back to, uh, I question that he, that he even knew where she would be at that time on that day. And then furthermore, here's the other thing. Who do you hire to kill her? Unless you hire somebody that knows her. Well, right. th- there's problems with your target too. I know it sounds crazy, but it has happened in the past where a husband or somebody has hired somebody, a complete stranger to kill somebody and they end up killing the wrong person. You're talking about a murder that's committed on a downtown street. Now I know that the downtown Cleveland can be, you know, a little quiet, uh, probably on a Sunday evening, right. but, but mm-hmm. still he could, this individual could have totally attacked the wrong person. Oh, definitely. I guess the only way that Sanford pulls it off in my mind is if he hired someone to not just kill her, kill her, but instructed that individual or the individual was smart enough to follow her for an extended period of time and wait and pick his pick his moment. Right, right, right. The problem with that is if everybody's doing what they say they're going to do and if everybody's who they are at the end of the day, then when this individual killed Aliza Sherman was about the same time, the exact same moment that her attorney should have been standing at that entrance way, holding the door open for her, waiting to get his client in out of the cold. Right. But okay. that lawyer was never there. Right. So if it is, if it, if it is the husband, the part that doesn't make a lot of sense is she would have been in that office building. Right. Right. Like if everything went as planned, the door would have been open. She would have been, but she, the lawyer wasn't there. Yeah. We don't know where the lawyer was. The lawyer story. The lawyer line didn't up even hear her screams because he wasn't there. Right. He was gone for, there was an individual that wasn't terribly close to her that heard her screams. And we know that he runs like Steven Seagal. We don't know that for sure. We're just assuming personally. I think that the police and the investigators think that Gregory Moore did it too. That's why I don't mind saying that I really believe that it was him. Yeah, and you can you can kind of hear that in the trailer from yesterday when they kind of say he's going to be charged. He's going to be charged in three different counties for those crimes. He's going to, you know, justice will be served there. That's what they say. And they say that they think that more answers are going to come out while he's in court. Well, he ends up pleading guilty in the end for this, and I think it's because he didn't want to have to give certain statements that would go on record. Yeah, because I think some of it is just he can't keep track of his own lies. Let me throw this at you, too. Oh, don't throw it too hard. And this is why, I, and this is an inference that I'm making. But I, this is what points to me that the investigators firmly believe he's suspect A number one. Uh huh. And we all know, and, you know, forget this idea that, well, they've never named him as a suspect or a person of interest. Screw that. They don't do that. Most smart police departments and law enforcement agencies don't do that anymore. They name somebody a suspect after they've slapped the cuffs on them right. and they're sitting in a jail cell preparing for the trial. Okay. Right. This is why I think that he's the number one suspect in, in, in proof to me of that. Because he looks like a penis with a bad haircut. Yeah. And <laughs> the thing is he committed that last bomb threat on in July of 2012. Right. Right. It was within days that the law enforcement were, had tracked him down and were convinced that it was him that had called in that bomb threat. So he was charged with this thing fairly early after the third bomb threat. He was slated to go to court 
and faced those charges in December of 2013. Well, what happened before he could go to court for those bomb threats? His, his client is killed in front of his office in March. Right. They didn't go to trial in December. When did they end up going to trial for this thing? They end up going to trial for it this year in 2017. They end up going to trial for it three and a half years later. Right. So not. And so this, I, this is why, this is why this makes him the number one suspect. Multiple motives. Well, li- no, but listen to this. If, if you are suspected of having committed multiple criminal acts and I'm investigating those criminal acts, but I suspect you of others, I can kind of investigate those while I'm looking into these bomb threats. And while I get that warrant to search your office and get that warrant to search your home and your car, right. I can get those for the bomb threats you called in, even though, because you have to have evidence, you have to be able to convince a judge that you deserve a warrant to look for items regarding the murder of Aliza Sherman. Right. You might not have that evidence. You might not have reason to do that. And I think that's why they waited to to bring it to trial for so long so that they could look into him for other angles. The thing is, I think police have done their due diligence here. I think they have done as much. Well, I shouldn't say as much as they can. Right. I think they're having problems putting him there at that scene. I think they're having problems putting him in that disguise and running from her, her dying body. And that's the only thing stopping them from, from bringing this to murder charges against this guy. That's why I would love to see if it's possible. I don't know the ins and outs of this, but if she's at a scheduled meeting that you kept changing the time for, and you lie to her saying you were there and you're not there and she dies on your doorstep, right? I, there's gotta on be your a, locked door. There's gotta be a way to file some kind of, wrongful death lawsuit against this individual or and or against his law firm that he worked for Mm -hmm. at the time. And therefore it opens up the doors to further investigating this guy as possibly having killed your mother or your loved one. We want to take this time to thank everybody for joining us in the garage, not only over the past week, mm-hmm. but for the entirety of 2017. We love each and every one of you, and thank you for joining us here. Thank you for going to the website, getting involved in the blog. And buying a t-shirt. Maybe some of you are rocking a Captain t-shirt or a True Crime Garage t-shirt. We are very thankful for each and every one of you. And whatever holiday you are are celebrating this time of year, mm-hmm. I hope you get to do that. I hope you have the opportunity to do that with friends, family, and loved ones. And hopefully you get to do it drunk. Yeah. Make oh. sure you make sure you hug your family and friends and you give them a big cheers. Yeah, make make sure you hug your your beer also cuz your beer is your friend and your beer likes you as well. And we want to invite all of you to join us right back here in the garage just past the new year. It's our first break. We're taking a break. Ever. Christmas, I mean, we, Christmas vacation. Nick goes on vacation a lot, but we don't <laughs> but we don't take breaks. So uh it's our first official break ever. Yeah. So when you see your friends and family for this holiday season, kiss them on the lips. Kiss them, hug them, give them a cheers and remind them to be good, be kind and don't litter. <laughs>